It is uh, uh, my pleasure this evening to introduce Jonathan Neville again as, as our speaker. He presented on September 7 on the Benjamin Winchester and William Smith influence on the Book of Mormon studies. On October 5th, he presented on how the Book of Mormon was translated. November 9th, he focused our attention on the burial mounds in North America. And tonight he comes to make the case that Hill Cumorah in New York is the one we need. I checked and discovered that I have at least seven of his books in my library. And among other things, oh, by the way, I wanna get the uh, share screen on here so that I can pull up my introduction. I think that's the one. Now, do you get to see the top of the Hill Camorra? Yes. All right, there's Angel Baroni on, on his stand on the top of Hill Camorra <laughs> in New York. Um, as I say, I have at least seven of his books and I appreciate his integrity and welcome him again to our forum tonight. There's at least two more books that I, that I want us to be able to invite him back for. Um, his uh, efforts on the city of Zarahemla and then what also happened to the Golden Plates are two of the books that he has not really reported on. But uh, this evening he'll be uh, giving us the report on the on Between the Hills, which uh, I have found mm -hmm. to be academically challenging and interesting as well. But in sure it'll bring up a lot of good questions. And so I want to welcome him back for uh, this presentation and anticipate uh, a couple more in the future. There is in the uh, in the book that he's currently reporting on, an, an ending quote that I think sort of captures the uh, sense that I have come to appreciate uh, his presentations in. And this is a quote that he pulled in from Joseph Smith saying, in order to conduct the affairs of the kingdom in righteousness, it is important that the most perfect harmony, kind feeling, good understanding and confidence should exist in the hearts of all the brethren that true charity, love one toward another, should characterize all proceedings. We're going to be able to pull that kind of a statement from, jo from Joseph <laughs> Smith. And it is, I think, uh, very close to the, to the theme for our uh, Book of Mormon perspectives. Makes it so I wanted to incorporate that this evening uh, in, in my introduction. If you would uh, bow with me in prayer, I would like to proceed, dear creator, and one who blesses our lives with love, hope, joy, all good things of worth. We approach you for your blessing as we study truths that have sprung forth from the earth. We represent differing viewpoints gathered here to inspect, learn about ancient mysteries, each treated with respect. We tend to our own perspectives, gathering information to reinforce. If asked that you help us listen prayerfully that we ascertain the divine course. This evening, we gather with Jonathan Neville, an erudite presenter, participant, and guest, to grapple with and try to understand the Book of Mormon geography, the promised land, and the lands of the dispossessed. We seek to resolve issues wherein evidences appear to be contradictory, where Book of Mormon activities took place, locations remain a mystery. And we have difficulty reconciling the evidences with our published history. So as we struggle with your word, we plead that you lead us to the victory. God of all living, the rocks that sing, the breezes that cool, the springtime and the fall. We explore our beautiful world, your creation, and in it we hear your call to live in harmony, to treat each other with respect, to learn to live in peace, to participate in the orchestration of nature, learning, refinement of knowledge to increase. And as we look upon our surroundings, our history of violence, disrespect and wars, we regret that we and our ancestors have ignored you. It chastens us to our cores. And we bow, humbled that in spite of our past, you still consider us of worth. And we rededicate our vow to build up the cause of your Zion and ours on earth. Amen. Jonathan, it's all yours.
I'm not sure where they went. I had to let them back in. Yeah, we don't want to lose we, them. We just lost connection. Did it come back? Okay. Yeah, there you are. You're back. <laughs> okay. I was curious. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. We have an echo that uh, means okay. somewhere we have an extra piece on. I think we lost him again. Beverly had just turned on her phone to find out what happened, and then ours okay. came on anyway. So okay, there we go. For a minute, we did too. Okay, well, there we are. Thank you for getting back to us. <clears throat> okay. It's your turn. Oh, all right. Well, I'll share my screen then. Thank you again, as always, Paul, for the introduction even though we didn't hear the very end of it, but um, I don't know what happened there. So I can just share my screen here and we'll make sure it works. Is that working? Yes. Okay. Well, this, um, as Paul mentioned, this is a, a case for the New York Camorra based on prophet scriptures and evidence. And I want to uh, start off here by letting you all know if you want a copy of the presentation. I know Paul records these, but if you want just the presentation as a, a PDF of, of the slides, just of the slides, you can email us here or email Paul and, and I can get them to you. That way you don't have to try to take, you know, pictures or whatever. Okay, this is what the book looks like between these hills. I'm not going to elaborate on that, but I I really have enjoyed these forums because of the approach Paul takes where we're just exploring ideas. And I, so I, I, I have this um, thing that I've been emphasizing lately about the psychology of belief and how people form their opinions and, and so on. And I, I, I just kind of review that briefly here because we're all content with our current beliefs or else we would change them, right? <clears throat> And we tend to, we don't like people trying to change our minds. It's uncomfortable. But at the same time, we, we enjoy learning new things. And that's how I see these forums as no one's here to try to change our minds about anything, but we're learning new things constantly. And, you know, Beverly and I have really enjoyed these, everyone we've been able to attend. And so it's the difference between persuasion and information. And so what I'm hoping to do tonight is to provide additional information that uh, we can all factor in however we want. Another element of the psychology of belief is this, the phenomenon of confirmation bias. And this is just a diagram that shows how we all tend to pick out of the universe of facts, the facts that confirm our beliefs. And I found this cartoon I thought was pretty funny. The scientist says, did you read my paper on confirmation bias? And his friend says, yes, but it only proved what I already knew, right? <laughs> so that's how a lot of times these things work. Another element of this is that what makes sense to some of us is incomprehensible to others. And we've all experienced that in different aspects of our lives. But even here, we're all um, interested in the Book of Mormon. We've studied it, read lots of commentaries and aspects of it to people outside of this community that are familiar with the Book of Mormon, issues involving the Book of Mormon can be incomprehensible. One other element of this is keeping our perspective because when an, an issue is important to us, sometimes we can have a distorted idea of how important the issue is to other people. And when we look around, we realize the problem that we are concerned about sometimes is insignificant to others. And I like to think about this when you go to the supermarket, everyone can workshop, learn and play, participate in society regardless of their religious beliefs. You might be in line with a Catholic, an atheist, Hindu, you know, pagan, LDS, Baptist, Buddhist, whatever, and we all can participate in society. So that's an important thing to keep in perspective as well, I think. At the same time, when someone says an issue is not important, it only means it's not important to them. But if an issue is important to us, we can assume it's also important to at least some other people. And, and with that in mind, I want to talk a little bit about this um, issue of the Hill Camorra. And just, I like to explain my biases up front. My bias currently is 
that the Hill Kumar in New York is the place of the final battles. And that's what I'm going to be going through here. At the same time, this is a real important point. A New York Kumara doesn't determine the other sites or the locations of Book of Mormon events. People who accept a New York Kumara have a variety of theories about where other events took place, and that's perfectly fine. I like to frame this as multiple working hypotheses. And here, this is a diagram of um, ancient Americans between about 800 BC and pre, you know, about the time Columbus came. And you can see in these different areas, these are all potential targets for Book of Mormon peoples, or at least uh, people that Lehi's descendants lived among if they weren't uh, the majority. So, so there's lots of room for multiple working hypotheses here. And I, I'd like to go over this idea why we, why multiple working hypotheses is a favorable approach because first off harmony, it limits the potential for professional conflict and rejection because all the hypotheses are considered and evaluated. And I think that's the spirit of these forums that Paul has hosted that we all uh, consider all these hypotheses together. Then objectivity is an important one because it helps to separate us from our own hypotheses. And it shifts from a personal investment in a hypothesis to testing the hypothesis. Uh, then this idea of mentality, it encourages lateral thinking and a focus on falsification instead of confirmation. In other words, we can look at these things from a variety of, of perspectives. And last, efficiency, it allows experiments to be designed to distinguish among competing hypotheses rather than evaluating a single one. Now, that, that's a lot of verbiage, but I, I hope that gives you a feel for the idea of multiple working hypotheses. We have a, a web page called Museum of the Book of Mormon, and there we have collected a lot of um, references about the history, evidences, and teachings of the Book of Mormon. And the, the overriding um, concept there is this idea of multiple working hypotheses where we present a variety of views that people can access. Because usually most web pages involving the Book of Mormon take a particular position, pro, con, or on geography and so on. We wanted to have something that's a little more um, neutral. Yeah, neutral, uh, ecumenical, you might say, but something that offers people a variety of things that they can consider. So the, another question to discuss is why study Kimura? And the first point I, I would suggest is that it has to do with the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon. And this was something Joseph Smith brought up when he was traveling through Ohio on Zion's camp in 1834. And he wrote this letter to his wife that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but I'll just read what he said here. He talked about wandering over the plains of the Nephites, recounting occasionally the history of the Book of Mormon, roving over the mounds of that once beloved people of the Lord, picking up their skulls and their bones as proof of its divine authenticity. So that's that phrase, proof of its divine authenticity. Now you all know that uh, these are the distribution of the mounds in Eastern United States. This map was created in the late 1800s, but it was this area in particular that um, Joseph crossed during Zion's camp from Kirtland down through um, Ohio, Indiana and Illinois till he got to the banks of the Mississippi where he wrote that. So this was the area that he referred to as being the um, plains of the Nephites, where they had the, the mounds of that once beloved people. So that's one reason to study Camorra. Another is to understand the text. You know, it's the text is vague when it comes to geography, it's subject to a variety of interpretations. And so if we have an idea of, of where to start with Camorra, that can affect our interpretation of the text. The other is to understand the evidence, the external evidence in terms of uh, archaeology, anthropology, geography, geology, and so on. All of those things are subject to a variety of interpretations. And I think if, if we can focus on Camorra as a, what I call a pin in the map, then we can interpret the sciences and external evidence accordingly. And of course, here's a... Um, famous verse out of the Doctrine and Covenant says, all have not faith, seek ye diligently, teach one another words of wisdom. This is kind of the motto, I think, for Paul's forums here, that we're all 
doing this. We all seek learning even by study and also by faith. It's the mind and the heart together. Here's a quotation that I really like. It's from uh, Russell M. Nelson, but he said, I think this is pretty much of universal application. He said he knows that good inspiration is based upon good information. So we want to be looking for good information. Now, when you go back to church history and you wonder what is good information, here's some of the varieties of um, Book of Mormon uh, geography related uh, ideas you can come up with. Uh, some said that uh, Lehi landed in Chile. Times and Seasons had an article about Zarahemla in Central America. Of course, Camorra in New York was repeated many times. There was discussion of a narrow neck of land. Um, Orson Pratt said that Zarahemla was uh, in Colombia. So there's a variety of, of things in church history and how much of that is good information. It's, it's not consistent. So we have to think about what is good and what isn't good information. And then when it comes to Camorra specifically, here's just a few of the proposals I've seen for where Camorra is. You can see there's quite a variety, right? <laughs> you can, if you look on the internet, there's some people who think Camorra is not even in the Americas. So then you, I asked, well, why are we looking in the he Western hemisphere in the first place? The Book of Mormon never mentions America. It never mentions the Western hemisphere. It doesn't even say what direction they sailed to. So why are we looking in the Western hemisphere? When I went back to church history, here's a few of the examples. I won't take the time to read all of these. I'm sure you're familiar with most of them, but these are accounts of what Moroni told Joseph Smith. Uh, the first one uh, was had to do with um, letter number four that Oliver Cowdery wrote. And Moroni said the book was gave a history of the Aborigines of this country. And he said, I'm just gonna read the part in, in gold. He said this history was written and deposited not far from that place, not far from Joseph Smith's house. And that's a, a statement that I think has been overlooked quite a bit because Moroni said the history was written not far from Joseph's house in New York. That's an interesting comment. Of course, we know it was deposited not far from that place. Then the second one on here is um, from the Wentworth letter where Joseph Smith said this important and interesting book, The History of Ancient America is Unfolded. The record, uh, we're formed by these records at America in ancient times. And then he went on to say the remnant are the Indians that now inhabit this country. So these are things that from Joseph Smith, not from the Book of Mormon itself, but from Joseph Smith saying what Moroni told him. And that's why uh, he taught that it was the history of ancient America. And then last on here is another excerpt from the Times and Seasons, the history of Joseph Smith, where Moroni said there was a book giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent. So when we look at this, you know, when we talk about the geography of the Book of Mormon, where we can't only go by the text, or we wouldn't have any reason to even be looking in the Western Hemisphere. We had to look outside of the text to reach a conclusion that the Western Hemisphere, this continent, this country, however you want to interpret these, but it's outside of the text. And that's why I think it's important to look at what uh, the early uh, early prophets have said. You know, I, I did this presentation for a bigger audience. A lot of it might be familiar with you, but I'll go through it quickly anyway, just to give us a, a common ground to be thinking about this. This is the vicinity where uh, Joseph lived, of course. This is the Palmyra area where um, the downtown where the Grandin building is. And then the log house where they, the Smiths lived and then the Hill Camorra. So that's the relation two to three miles apart of each of these locations. And so the Hill Camorra is at the south there. You can see it. Uh, the only reference that we have in the, um, in the scriptures was DNC 128 in, in the LDS Doctrine and Covenants, where uh, Joseph Smith referred to Camorra in, in connection with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon to be revealed. We know, I'm sure we're all familiar with this, Glad Tidings from Camorra. That letter was originally published in the Times and Seasons in September of 1842. It was a, it was a letter that Joseph wrote and he sent it to the editor of the, of the Times and Seasons to be published. 
which is one reason why I say that he was not the functional editor, he was only the nominal editor. But uh, it's interesting to think about the context of when that was published because just the year before in 1841, his brother Don Carlos had published letter seven in the same times and seasons. And this is letter seven is the one that talks specifically about Camorra being right there in New York. Here's a quotation from it. The fact that here between these hills, he was, that's where I took the title of my book. He was talking about the hill Camorra where Joseph got the plates and then to the west about a mile away is another parallel hill. And he said it was between these two hills that the entire power and national strength of the Jaredites and Nephites were destroyed. And then he, he referred to it in this valley. He said this hill by the Jaredites was called Rama. And so it, he was very specific in identifying the hill in New York as the Hill Cumorah of the Book of Mormon. And I think at this point, everyone agrees, every historian, I think I'm sure everybody here on this call agrees that President uh, Oliver Cowdery declared it was a fact that it happened. He just, he did. And so, and I, I say President Oliver Cowdery because he was the assistant president of the church at the time when he wrote these letters. So uh, here's another quotation from that letter. Um, showing, looking west from the Hill Camorra, you can see in the far distance, there's one line of trees that kind of follows a little ravine or a river. It actually, it's part of an embankment there that we may have time to talk about. When, when um, Heber C. Kimball joined the church in 1832, he went to the Hill Camorra, and he said he could still see the embankments around the hill. And I've looked at it on a topographical map, and there's only one little bit of it left, and it's a, right about where those trees kind of form a point. I don't know if you can tell that in that picture, but it's, there's still, you can see on a, a detailed topographical map, one point left of that embankment. Okay. So Joseph's contemporaries and successors all consistently reaffirmed the New York, what changed? And as a historian, I was really interested in, in what caused this idea to shift from, away from New York to other sites. So I looked at, of course, these 1842 articles about uh, Central America and the Times and Seasons suggested that uh, Zarahemla was down in Guatemala and the ruins in Central America were left by the Nephites. And yet these articles changed no one's mind about the New York Camorra. Everybody's still after that. Well, as an example here, letter seven was republished both before and after the 1842 articles. Um, Don Carlos, as I mentioned, published them in 1841 in the Times and Seasons, but Joseph's brother William published them in 1844 in The Prophet, which was a, a Mormon newspaper in New York City. So no one considered the 1842 articles about Central America to have an impact on the New York Camorra. But then in 1910, there was a book published by Charles Shook called Camorra Revisited. And he, he, in some detail, he said there is no archaeological evidence for the Book of Mormon. And therefore, you know, it can't be a real history. And I think it was in response to this that led um, uh, L.E. Hills and others to reassess the Book of Mormon geography. And, uh, as, and some of you may know more detail about this, which I'd love to, to know more about. But... In 1917, he published his, his book, and I have a copy, an actual copy from 1917, where he proposed Camorra being in Mexico, and he published this map. As you can see here, I circled it in red where he identified where Camorra is. And it, it says copyright April 6, 1917, from L.E. Hills. And, and he, as, as near as I can tell, he was the first to really identify Camorra in, in Central America, Southern Mexico according to this, this is what his book looks like. So he proposed there were two Camorras. The real Camorra was in Southern Mexico and the traditional Camorra in Western New York is a false tradition that was based on speculation. And that's the origin of what I call the Mesoamerican two Camorras theory, which I call M2C. I put a little kind of a logo to identify it, but he's, he was saying the real Camorra of Mormon 6-6 is in Mexico. 
And that became somewhat uh, more widely accepted to the point that um, Joseph Fielding Smith wrote an, uh, an editorial criticizing this idea. And he, he talked about within recent years, this was in the 1930s that he wrote this, but he said people were starting to say the Nephites and Lamanites were confined to the territory in Central America and the southern portion of Mexico. And he said, this means that Camorra has to be located in Central America, notwithstanding the teachings of the church, to the contrary. So he objected to it on the grounds of what people had taught. Then he went on to say that because of this theory, some members of the church have become confused and greatly disturbed in their faith in the Book of Mormon. And for that reason, he wanted to provide evidence to show that Hill Kumar really is in New York, essentially. But, you know, he was just one voice of, of many. And despite what he said, LDS scholars adopted the Mesoamerican theory as well. And one of the best known is John Sorensen, his book Mormon Codex here. Well. Book of Mormon Central, I'm sure you're all familiar with Book of Mormon Central. And they were uh, founded and operated by followers of, of Dr. Sorensen. He wrote this about the New York Camorra. And this is a really important um, quotation from his book because his book was so widely sold. So ours, it, it's one of the best selling books um, from Deseret Book regarding Book of Mormon geography. What he wrote was, there remain Latter-day Saints who insist that the final destruction of the Nephites took place in New York, but any such idea is manifestly absurd. Hundreds of thousands of Nephites traipsing across the Mississippi Valley to New York pursued, why, by hundreds of thousands of Lamanites, is a scenario worthy only of a witless sci-fi movie, not of history. So that's kind of the, um, I would have to say, the majority approach of scholars Book of Mormon scholars um, everywhere, as near as I can tell. Most people think the New York Camorra just doesn't make any sense, which, of course, for me, only motivates me to understand why that change, that shift in, in view. And I, I point out that Book of Mormon Central's very logo is, is based on the Mesoamerican Two Camorras theory because they adopted this Mayan glyph as though that's the original language of the Book of Mormon. So again, getting back to where is Camorra? This was a, a map published in BYU studies that adopted the LE Hills map essentially. And they put Camorra here on the, on the Gulf of Mexico in Southern Mexico. Of course, I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Hill Camorra expedition team. Um, who's had several trips down there. These are great guys. We've, we've met them and, and had some discussions with them. Maybe they're, some of them are on the call. I don't know. But they, they focus a lot of effort to finding Camorra in Mexico. Here's another more um, abstract map that Dr. Sorensen put together to show Hill Camorra. Again, according to his interpretation of the text, it has to be in this just north of this, what he calls the narrow neck. In LDS seminaries, they use this map, which is again a, a, a version of the LE Hills map to show Camorra in that same kind of a Southern Mexico area. At BYU right now, they're teaching all the students Camorra in this location, which again is an abstract map, but it's, it's rejecting the New York Camorra completely and it's describing it as effectively in Central America. The only thing they've done is rotated it about 90 degrees because of the east-west issue. I, I, I'm, again, I'm not trying to get into the whole geography discussion, just showing you how Camorra is being presented uh, widely today. And some of the most prominent uh, BYU scholars, uh, Tyler and Taylor here, are, are the ones that are teaching this out of this map. Uh, these guys, these are great guys. I know them both personally, but they have been um, doing a, a weekly presentation on the Book of Mormon last year, and they have between 150, almost 200,000 views every week of their YouTube videos. That's how widespread this is. And they, of course, they show Camorra there. So we get back to this question of where is Camorra? How can we figure this out? What makes sense? Um, I, some of you know I proposed this 
kind of a map of the Book of Mormon where the green is the Nephite land and the pink is or purple is the Lamanite land with the, the rivers being the border between them. And I don't want to get into the whole discussion of why that is, but for me, this, this fits. And I wrote this book about Moroni's America, which some of you may have seen. But let's get back to what Oliver Cowdery said, because it, we all agree that Oliver Cowdery said this was a fact. So what do we do with that? Uh, the way I say it is the base over Kamara based on which assumption you accept. Either Oliver was wrong or Oliver was correct. That's really the foundation of this whole discussion. If you think Oliver was wrong, then bias confirmation kicks in and we can interpret the text accordingly. We find selected quotations from different leaders or scholars or scientists. And then we can interpret archeology, span anthropology, geology, geography, et cetera, to, conf to confirm our bias that Oliver was wrong about Camorra. The other way is if you assume Oliver was correct, same thing happens. Bias confirmation <laughs> kicks in. We interpret the text, we find selected quotations in the sciences we can interpret to confirm it. So what do we do in this situation? Well, I like to say there's three sources that we can look at. Um, the prophets, the scriptures, and the evidence. And I, I do it graphically this way. It's kind of a tripartite approach because when, we, when I say prophets, I'm referring to Oliver Cowdery, um, Joseph Smith, and their contemporaries, essentially. I mean, there's, there's subsequent prophets that have said this also, but it was the people who knew Joseph Smith, things that he said and taught that were not ever necessarily put in writing that I looked to. And of course, the scriptures, the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants primarily, and then external evidence. And when you do this, though, to say the Hill Camorra is in Mexico, there, you can't find any support from the prophets for that because they all said it was in, in New York. So I'd like to look at this and say, well, what, um, how do we approach what the prophets teach? The one way to do it is that intellectuals will take what the prophets teach and assess those teachings for credibility and viability, and then they develop better theories. That's kind of the, the process that, that's happened with Camorra. Another approach is to say, to assess the evidence of the, or the, the evidence to corroborate the teachings of the prophets instead of to uh, test them for credibility. And then believers discover additional confirmations. So that's the framework I try to approach this with. Um, then I ask myself the question, well, why did Oliver Cowdery say it was a fact that Camorra is in New York? Was, was he just misled? Was he speculating? And so I went back to the history to see what happened. And Lucy Mack Smith wrote a, a very interesting uh, thing in her history. This is her, her um, rendition of what Joseph told her that Moroni told him. And the first part of it was similar. Now, Joseph, Beware, when you go to get the plates, your mind will be filled with darkness and all manner of evil will rush into your mind. And we know from several accounts that that's exactly what happened. And that's one reason it took him four years of preparation before he could get the plates. Uh, this all manner of evil rush into your mind to prevent you from keeping the commandments of God. You may not succeed in doing his work. So that's what Moroni told Joseph Smith. But then he went on to say, the record is on a side hill on the hill of Camorra, three miles from this place. Remove the grass and moss and you'll find a large flat stone. Pry that up and you'll find the record under it, laying on four pillars of cement. Then the angel left him. And that was fascinating to me because this is how, what Lucy said, Joseph told her, and I told him. And this was during the very first visit in 1823. So according to Lucy, it was Moroni who first identified the hill as Camorra. And those of you who are familiar with church history know that Parley P. Pratt said the same thing. Parley Pratt said that Moroni called this hill Camorra anciently. And so here's what it looks like. You can go to the Joseph Smith papers and see in the original record from Lucy Mack Smith's history that she said she identified she said that Moroni identified it as the hill of Camorra, three miles from their house. 
And then as we uh, talked earlier, Oliver Cowdery's rendition of this, here's Moroni's visit, but then he said he proceeded and gave an account of the promises made to the fathers. He uh, gave a history of the Aborigines of this country. And then um, he said this history is written and deposited not far from that place. So the Hill Cumorah is not very far from Joseph's home. It's about, it's a little less than three miles, depending on how you walk there directly or on the roads. These are the, the modern roads today as they exist. But you, you can see uh, the Canandaigua Road was a road down to uh, Canandaigua that Joseph was walking on in an incident I'll, I'll tell you about here in just a minute. So today, if you go there, you can, this is a map. I assume most many of you have visited there, but you can walk to the Hill Camorra from Joseph's house pretty easily. Okay, and I took this picture with my drone to show the relationship uh, of the two sites. All right, uh, and then of course, Moroni and I went on to tell him that he could translate the, the plates with the Urim and Thummim. Uh, he, here again, this is, a picture of the Hill Cumorah in the late 1800s. We don't know for sure how many trees were on it in Joseph's day, but it was not heavily forested the way it is today. But he was he was able, when he had the visit with Moroni, to have a vision of the hill and see exactly where it was so that when he visited there, he would recognize it. Now, this was Almost four years later, after he got after they got married, Joseph and Emma moved back to Palmyra from Harmony here. And they, uh, this is in late January, January, I guess. And so they stayed there for a little while, but then um, Lucy recorded that uh, after they moved back, his father had a reason to send Joseph down to Manchester on business. And on this map, you can see the Smith home at the top, the Hill Camorra about halfway down, and Manchester's at the bottom. It's still a town there today. So Joseph went down to Manchester, and when he was coming home, he came late. Uh, they, Lucy recorded here that they always had an anxiety about him when he was absent. But he finally came home, and they asked, why have you been so late? You're three hours late. And Joseph smiled and said in a very calm tone, I have taken the severest chastisement that I've ever had in my life. And my husband, Lucy's husband, supposing it was from one of the neighbors, was angry and observed, I would like to know what business anybody has to find fault with you. And Joseph said, stop. It was the angel of the Lord. As I passed by the hill of Camorra, where the plates are, the angel met me and said that I had not been engaged enough in the work of the Lord. So here again, Joseph referred to the hill as Camorra to explain where he had been. So his family was familiar with it. Remember, he had told his mother that the angel called it Camorra back in 1823. So from then on, it was always the hill Camorra. In this case, he just he referred to the hill Camorra, knowing that they would know where that was. So I think it's, that's pretty well established that by, even before he got the plates, Joseph was referring to this hill as Camorra. Um, and I'll skip over this. He just went on to say what Moroni told him that it was on the following September, he would finally get the plates. I like this picture looking north from the Hill Camorra because it, it shows how, um, how, how the different it was back then. Nowadays, if you look north, there's a lot more trees. The, not all the farms are plowed like this. So we ask again, why did Oliver Cowdery say it was a fact? Well, he had Joseph to rely on, of course, the things that he said. In Mormon 6.6, Mormon said that he, uh, he hid up in the Hilkmore all the records which had been entrusted to him by the hand of the Lord, save it were these few plates. And so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little faster to pick this up so because I have a lot of material here, I can tell. But the repository, this is really a key point, the repository contained the Nephite records as well as these other Nephite artifacts. And where is the repository in New York? Well, we know Moroni buried the plates there. Orson Pratt said that Moroni was inspired to select a department of the hill separate from the great sacred depository of the numerous volumes hit up by his father. This was in the Millennial Star. So 
he's or Pratt explained that there are two separate parts of the hill. One contained the repository of the Nephite records from Mormon, and the other was a stone box. And I had a um, uh, one of the BYU professors asked me one time, well, why would Moroni put a separate box in the hill for the, the bridge plates if the repository is right there? He could have just had Joseph Smith go in the repository. And I said, well, remember, Joseph was tempted just by the, the bridge plates, the small records. For four years, he, he had to be trained and tutored and so on to overcome the temptation of, of just those plates. So he it, there's no way he could have gone into the repository without stealing, you know, the gold or being overcome by temptation. So it made sense that Moroni would put this in a different part of the hill before Joseph was fully ready to, um, to deal with it. Now, that I'm sure you know that there are several accounts of Joseph and Oliver actually visiting the repository. Brigham Young talked about this. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take the time to read all these. I assume most of you are familiar with you with them. And if not, you're welcome again to have this PowerPoint. But I want to move on to some other things. I'll just mention a couple of them. Brigham Young said Oliver Cowdery went with the prophet Joseph when they deposited these plates. When Joseph got the plates, the angel instructed them to carry them back to the hill of Cumorah. And when they, Oliver says that when they went, the hill opened, they walked into a cave in which there was the largest spacious room. Uh, they were all together in this room, more plates than probably many wagon loads. And then he says, I tell you, this is coming not only from Oliver Cowdery, but others who are familiar with it. Okay, Heber C. Kimball said there were, there were more rooms, or more records than 10 men could carry, books piled up on tables, book upon book. Um, I think Wilfred Woodruff talked about it here. Uh, oh, this is another one. Father Smith, Oliver Cowdery, and others walking into the Hillcomora seeing all these records. So these were people who went, here's Wilfred Woodruff talking about it. These were Joseph and his contemporaries who actually visited this repository in the Hill Camorra in New York that, that all these other people spoke about. Um, this was Elizabeth Kane. She was on a visit to Utah and she asked where the plates were. And she was answered they were in a cave that Oliver Cowdery, though now an apostate, would not deny that he had seen them. He had been to the cave. This is what people were telling her when she visited Utah. Oliver Cowdery and Joseph were in the cave this third time. And they said the room was about 15 feet high, piled with similar gold plates. Another one said uh, out in Cedar City, Brigham Young described an apartment in the Hill Camorra that some had entered. Um, here's some more. Any, anyway, there's a lot of these accounts. I don't have time to go through them all. But um, the point is that Oliver Cowdery could say it was a fact because Joseph told him what Moroni had told him and because Oliver had been in the repository. So to me, that's a pretty compelling reason for Oliver Cowdery to be so um, adamant and unambiguous that it was a fact that the Hill Camorra, the final battles took place there in Western New York. And then uh, of course, Joseph Smith and BNC 128 we've talked about. Now, what about the scriptures? The scripture, New York Camorra doesn't determine the other sites or locations of Book of Mormon events. Here's again the one that I propose as an explanation. And I guess, Paul, we could talk about this another time. I'll just show you quickly how I interpret the, the basic features that people talk about. Uh, let me go back to this. Because one of the things that I find really interesting is the Book of Mormon talks about a narrow neck a narrow neck of land, which sounds like it's different because it has a different modifier, and a small neck. And everybody assumes those are all three the same thing, as well as a narrow passage. And I think they're all different things. That's my overview of it. It also talks about a sea west south, implying there's a sea, also a sea west north. Um, this one, yeah, this might take a little while to explain. Let me give you one, just one example of how we can interpret the text and in light of Joseph's environment. Uh, what does the phrase, the head of the river mean? And some people have, this is a quotation, I don't remember where I got it, but it said, the key to understanding the geography of the Book of Mormon is to understand the meaning of the phrase, head of the river Sidon. 
This leads to the identity of the river. Everything else flows from there. So does the head of the river mean the headwaters or does it mean a confluence? You can see that here. Uh, this is the uh, passage in Alma 22 in, in the LDS chapters. It talks about the head of the river Sidon in a couple of places. I'm assuming you all know about this. And, and people refer back to Lehi's dream where he said, he looked to behold from whence it came and he saw the head thereof and at the head there, I saw his, um, your mother, Sariah. And then at the end, he says, I cast my eyes towards the head of the river. So people assume that the head of the river means the source. But I point out that the, the area where the river is coming from could be either headwaters or a confluence. Either way, it's still coming from that direction. You can see here, the one on the left is a joining of two rivers coming together. And the one on the right is just the headwaters. So Lehi's... Uh, the explanation can fit either one of these, um, as, as you can see here. So we know from the text that the head of the river Sidon is south of the city of Zarahemla. If the head of the river Sidon means the headwaters, then Sidon starts in the south and flows north past the city of Zarahemla. If it means a convergence, then the Sidon flows south past the city of Zarahemla toward the convergence. You see the distinction there? So that's why this is such a key point. Um, what does the head of the river Sidon mean? And is there a river flowing from the land of Nephi to the land of Zarahemla? Let's start with this one first. Is there a river flowing north from the land of Nephi down to the land of Zarahemla? Yes, both in North America and in Central America. In, in Central America or Mesoamerica, the north flowing rivers are the Guijalva and the Umasinta, as, as you all know. In North America, it's the Tennessee River that flows north from the land of Nephi to the land of Zarahemla, as you can see on the map here. And a lot of people never thought of, of a north flowing river in North America, but ten, the Tennessee River, if you live in Tennessee, is well known for flowing north, where it goes up to meet the Ohio. So the idea of a river flowing north from the land of Nephi to the land of Zarahemla is, is satisfied in both locations. Um, people have consulted dictionaries to justify both source and confluence, and there's no definitive answer. It's just bias confirmation, except for one thing. If Joseph didn't really translate the plates, in other words, he just read off a seer stone, then his environment is irrelevant, right? Because it wouldn't have been influenced by his environment. But if he really did translate the plates, as I believe, with the Urim and Thummim, then his environment is highly relevant because then the language of the Book of Mormon is in his own language and from his own um, experience. And in this case, this is really interesting because we can see what the phrase head of the river meant to Joseph Smith in his location. This is an overview of the Susquehanna River, where the headwaters are up in the upper right by Cooperstown. And the Susquehanna flows all the way to the Atlantic through Pennsylvania and a little bit of New York. Um, so you can see the river there in dark blue. It flows past the priesthood restoration site in Harmony, where most of the Book of Mormon was translated, and it flows past Binghamton, just like this. So this is the, the house where the rest restored house where Joseph and Emma lived when they translated the first part of the Book of Mormon. And this is the Susquehanna River. So I was there earlier this year doing some filming. And this little diagram there points out that the Susquehanna River was a major thoroughfare for tra river traffic. It's about 20 miles upriver from Binghamton. Uh, this is where, again, where the Priesthood Restoration site is. So from from the Priesthood Restoration site to Binghamton is about 20 miles down the river. So Jonathan Edwards, and I have a book coming out about him, but Jonathan Edwards was very influential in my view on the Book of Mormon and, and Joseph Smith's language. And I'm not gonna get into his background, but he, he wrote a letter about um, his son that he sent to live with an Indian tribe near Binghamton. And you're gonna see why this is important in a minute. I know it sounds irrelevant right now, but I'll show you why. So this, this Indian settlement, Onagagua, 
Um, it was where Jonathan Edwards sent his son. And he described it as situated on the Susquehanna River near the head of the river, about 200 miles southwest of Albany. So the head of the river here was in Binghamton. It was not at the head at the headwaters. Why is that important? Because Binghamton, New York is the confluence of these two rivers and it's called the head of the river Susquehanna. So, and it's, again, it's only 20 miles from Harmony. There's even a park there, Confluence Park. Here's a picture I took of the confluence of the rivers at the head of the river there, the park and so on. So Jonathan Edwards gave us a real word application of the term head of the river. And it wasn't just any river, it was the Susquehanna River. So um, the discussion continues, but what I wanted to point out here is if you interpret the text with Camorra being in New York, you can see how the head of the river would mean a convergence of the river at the, the confluence of the Ohio and the Mississippi River. If you think that Camorra is in Central America, then you think the head of the river is headwaters. And that's why you interpret it the way they do down there. So I do all this just to show you an example of how the, the text can, is malleable or um, can fit both ideas. Okay, so the last one that let's talk about briefly is evidence. This is the idea of multiple working hypotheses. We talked before about these ancient peoples in, in the Americas. And I wanted to start with talking briefly about the Jaredites. This was uh, an analysis done by Lynn and David Rosenthal. I don't know if you all are familiar with their book. They, they think the entire Book of Mormon took place in Baja, California. But they pointed out here that when you look at the Book of Ether and it shows how far they went and traveled and so on, the Jaredites crossed a, a large body of water and then they reached the seashore and then 344 days at sea, they reached the choice land. And so they looked at this, the ocean currents and these are the places where people could land in the Americas from um, the old world. Again, here's another diagram of it. And they basically identified some sites here that people could land and they said, well, where did the Jaredites go? And they, we know they started off in the Middle East, Iraq, roughly. They think that they crossed Asia, which I think most people do. From Asia, they left and crossed the Atlantic, North Atlantic, Pacific, Pacific I'm sorry, and landed somewhere in the Americas. They, they think that they landed down there where the yellow arrow is in um, Baja, California. And I propose instead that they landed a little further north of that. And I've explained this before that uh, there's an Indian tribe in, in British Columbia that their origin tradition is that they came in, in boats and they had glowing pearls inside. So, I mean, there's more to that as well, but there's all kinds of um, ways you can interpret this, but this at least is consistent with the science about crossing the, the North Pacific. So from there, in my view, they, the Jaredites, the descendants of Jared himself, cross over into the Great Lakes area. Whereas the brother of Jared and his friends, which the record doesn't even talk about, went further to these other civilizations. And that to me explains why there's Asian DNA and, and so on. That's just one explanation, but it's consistent with what we know about the science and the text. And then here's the route that we think Lehi took. Again, you can, we, I guess Boyd talked about this a little bit, but that leads up to this Camorra in New York. So that's all an alternative interpretation of the text. But the reason this is significant, remember this book Camorra Revisited that I talked about earlier that led to the whole Mesoamerican two Camorras theory? because Charles Shook said he claimed there is no archeological evidence. And he said that there is only one civilization in ancient North America. But after his book was published, archeologists and anthropologists found two separate ones, the Adena and the Hopewell. And so Charles Shook did, was unaware of that when he wrote his book. And if you look at the, some of the maps of the Adena and the Hopewell, the Adena were the more ancient 
correspond, in my view, to the uh, Jaredites. And the Hopewell were more recent Nephite time periods. And if you look at this and, and see where Camorra is up there in, in Western New York, there was an overlap there. And there are Adena and Hopewell uh, sites in, in those areas. Here's another version of this, where you can see how th those two civilizations overlapped. So that gets back to, the, to my geography here. You can see how that all works. I've talked about this before. Uh, just as a, an overview here, Lehigh Landing, the land of Nephi, they go on the uh, north flowing Tennessee River to the land of Zarahemla, city of Zarahemla is across from Nauvoo, the land bountiful, and then of course, uh, the land of Camorra up in New York. Just quickly, I'll, I'll mention here that uh, the Hopewell ceremonial earthworks, you know, for a long time, archaeologists thought they were uh, a, a very limited population, not very sophisticated, but as they've studied some of these earthworks more and more, particularly the the Great Hopewell Road in Ohio, they've seen that there, these, whatever civilization this was, was much more sophisticated than they originally thought because of the geometry, the amount of communication it would take to build these things over large distances and so on. So when we look in, in Western New York, there are both Adena and Hopewell sites. Uh, the archaeologist at University of Buffalo, I went to visit a site or two with him, and he, he gave us a list of 20 or 30 Hopewell sites. And then we, I visited Adena Mounds there in Western New York as well. So we, we know that both Adena and Hopewell lived in this area, and they correspond to the time frames of the Book of Mormon. In the Palmyra Museum, they have some artifacts from dating from different periods, but I uh, Farmers there have dug up lots of them. They used to give them away. Kids used to skip the arrowheads and stones. And I'm, let me just finish with this and I'll answer lots of questions maybe if you have some, but this is from touring Ohio. And it's very interesting because they say, uh, they talk about the archeological evidence of, um, and the similar, similarities of artifacts from Ohio and the Mayan culture, both. Did the, and they asked, did the mound builders come from Central America or did the Mayan culture come from the mound builders or are they both branches of the same tree? And in my view, that's how, how it works out that they are branches from the same tree starting with the Jaredites of whom only the descendants of Jared were killed in, in Camorra as well as Lehi's descendants that expanded throughout the, the Western hemisphere. Well, I've talked more than I planned to because I wanted to answer lots of questions, if there are any. Uh, again, if you want to get a copy of the presentation, just send us an email here at um, this webpage. I'll leave that up. And I, 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 it looks like our time's up, so I'll turn the time back over to you, Paul. Thank you. I, I want to put in a plug for the next sessions and then uh, open the forum for discussion. So. Please don't anyone go away if you don't, well, unless you just simply want to pick up the, the re record of it. But uh, next week we have the uh, open forum in which we'll have the previous eight speakers coming back. So hopefully Jonathan will be able to come back and give us a, a five minute review so we can have some more discussion on it. And the following week we have Josh Gailey of the Monongahela, Pennsylvania group. The ones descended from the Sydney Rigdon Brickertonite uh, uh, group. And he'll be addressing the mapping of the Book of Mormon. And his, I think, is particularly interesting because that group has, I think, uh, rather subtly gotten itself involved in, I think, over 22, 22 countries uh, sharing the Book of Mormon message. And then on the 29th of March, we have the testimonies from Roger Gilbert. We have uh, about six people that have volunteered to share the testimonies. And we could put another one or two if you'd like to uh, get five minutes there to share your testimony about the Book of Mormon. Then Ralph Willis will be coming back on April 20, on April 5. He presents the Choctaw Vantage Point, the uh, first, first Nations Vantage Point on the Book of Mormon. George Potter, the, uh, the gentleman who presented, a, presented the uh, land of Nephi in South America and in Peru, will be coming back to show the, the uh, Book of Mormon story as it's seen in, the, in Arabia, where he has spent some 20 years. 
Faye Shaw will then be on the 18th of April sharing the uh, New Covenant uh, edition. John Hamer will be sharing with us on the 26th. And uh, he is pastor of Community of Christ in Toronto. And his, his, his uh, focus, I think, will be on the, the uh, 19th century themes in the Book of Mormon. Um, he'll be followed by Elroy Hendrickson, who is from uh, Belgium. And uh, his presentation is on tape, a, a brief one, actually. And it uh, will show a European perspective on the Book of Mormon. And then Rick Bennett. Uh, I believe he's with us this evening. Rick Bennett uh, is the host of the Gospel Tangents, and he's been interviewing numerous people with Book of Mormon ideas, and so his will be a fascinating presentation as well. And beyond that, the the uh, the agenda is open, and others of you that would like to claim a spot to share a perspective are welcome to contact me to do that. I'll be kicking out an email tomorrow with with my email on it and the list, so you'll be acquainted with it. Now then, back to the questions, back to the discussion. My apologies for not getting 